uh, I believe that God's going to impart something to us today that's going to set us free. How many of you want to be set free today? Amen. So I'm just asking uh, in advance for the Lord to move. And this is a word that's been on my heart for more than a year. Uh, I sat in the front row over a year ago and the Lord dropped this into my spirit. And uh, we've been working on it ever since. I just want you to stand in agreement with me that the Holy Spirit is going to move and communicate uh, through me, in spite of me, to you, to you online and to you in the house. Can you can you agree with me on that this morning? All right. Uh, Before you're seated, let me just begin. Uh, by saying hello, good morning. For those of you joining us for the first time, thank you for being here. We're so glad that you're with us, even online. My name is Josh, and I'm the campus pastor of our Chester County campus, along with my wife, Corinne. And it's so good to have you in the house. Pastor Sam's in Florida today, preaching, suffering for Jesus down there. Um, and uh, and uh, here we are. So somebody say amen. 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 All right, all right. So I like to start uh, with the word and... Um, I'm going to bring you into John chapter 14 and verse 27, and then we're going to get started. Is that fair? You guys good? All right, come on. The Bible says in John 14 and 27, I am leaving you with the gift. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. Peace of mind and heart, and the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give, so don't be troubled or afraid. Come on, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray, God, that as we open our heart and we open your word, that you'd speak to us, that you change us. Lord, may we never be the same again. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, what's up? Have a seat. What's up? Turn to your other neighbor and say, don't panic. If you're with us online, just type that in the comments section right now. Don't panic. Don't panic. Today we're wrapping up our series, The Panic Room, which is based on this book by Pastor Troy Maxwell. If you haven't picked this up yet, you can do so on your way out. If you're with us online, you can uh, message us in the comments. Our team's online with you right now. Uh, If you're watching this later, you can email us at hope at freedom.life about how to get a copy of The Panic Room, the book. The panic room. It's really appropriate uh, considering the last couple of years. How many of you would concede the last couple of years have been a little uh, unusual, right? Perhaps uh, unprecedented, okay? Maybe even unsettling. And as a result, we've seen a rise in some of these uh, mental health related things like anxiety and depression. And there's so many things that are kind of feeding this this funnel of fear right now. And it's, it's things from fear at its fundamental level. It's loss. We've experienced some loss this, these last couple of years. It's sickness. It's grief. It's isolation, right? We're not meant to do life alone. We're meant to do life uh, together. Uh, we've seen financial impact. We are seeing war right now in Eastern Europe. And these are all factors that are contributing uh, to to things like fear and anxiety and depression. And I want to say as we begin uh, to close out this series this morning uh, in the panic room that mental health is a real thing, folks. It's it's a real thing. According to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, general anxiety disorder affects 6.8 million adults. That's 3.1% of the U.S. population, and women are twice as likely to be affected as men. Major depressive disorder, uh, it's the leading cause of disability in adults, actually in, from ages 15 to 44, and affects more than 16.1 million Americans, or about 6.7% of the population ages 18 and older in a given year. These are real statistics and uh, it's a real crisis. It's a real problem. Mental health is a real thing. And I say that today to set the table and say that I am not going to address the clinical side of mental health this morning. But if you are struggling in these areas, you should seek help. If you're sick, you should see a doctor. Somebody say amen. Right? Well, I'm not a mental health professional. Somebody say amen. <laughs> My wife is, actually. I'm not. She's a therapist. I'm not. Um, but I want to say, I'm going to stay in my lane this morning, and we're going to talk about, because there's, there's legitimate clinical and physical things, something, something's even going on chemically in our brains and so forth. Those are legitimate, but I want to talk this morning about the spiritual answer to mental health. Mental health. Does that sound good? You and I are complicated, 
right? We're very complicated in our design. We have, we have these physical bodies and we have a spirit. Some of us even have an intellect. That was a joke. We should all have an intellect, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so I want to talk to you this morning about how to be set free in your spirit even while seeking help physically because these are, these are we got to get our arms around the whole the whole problem. And this is going to lead us to health and wholeness. Is that fair? All right. So let's recap real quick. Week one, Pastor Sam preached and he talked about the power of prayer. If you missed it, go back into the Freedom Life app or on our YouTube channel or on Facebook and you can watch that. Last week, Pastor Troy Maxwell, guest speaker and author of this here book, uh, spoke about fear and he shared some of the story behind the book, and he, he talked specifically about the power of fear and that stronghold that it represents in our lives. So this morning, my goal is to bridge the gap uh, between the, the, the power of prayer and the power of fear, and I want to talk about the power of the presence of God. There is no panic in the presence. That's the title of my message today. There's no panic. If you were with Jesus right now, I don't care what you're going through, it would be nothing in his presence, right? You'd throw it all at his feet and say, thank you, Jesus. Just to be in his presence, everything else would be irrelevant. So this morning, we're going to bridge that gap. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Write this down. I saw you online, Miss Joyce. Just type this in the comments for me. There's no panic in the presence. Now, I want to emphasize this morning specifically the dunamis power of God. Say dunamis. Dunamis power of God. The Greek word dunamis is used 120 times in the Bible. And it's a thing. Turn to your neighbor and say it's a thing. It's a thing. Dunamis power. Dunamis means strength, power, or ability. How many of you could use some strength, power, or ability Amen? Maybe just in the back of your mind, you just need a little more strength, a little more power, a little, more, a little ability. So dunamis is the root word for our English words, dynamite, dunamis, dynamite, dynamo, and dynamic. And we see it used in different ways throughout the Bible. Uh, for example, in the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25, the servants are given uh, wealth, they're given these talents to invest based on their dunamis, based on their Ability to handle finances. Come on, that'll preach, Pastor Dale. They're given that ability based on their dunamis. They're given the talents based on their dunamis power. In Mark chapter 9, verse 1, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of God arrive in great power, right? Power. Here again, it's the Greek word dunamis. Dunamis can also refer to a moral power or an excellence of soul. Dunamis can refer to inherent power, uh, power residing in a thing or by the virtue of its nature, i.e. the power of God, the dunamis power of God. So in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus tells the Sadducees, man, what a powerful scripture, Matthew twenty two twenty nine. 29, he says, your mistake is you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. Now that's a bit of a paradox if you think about it because these were the Sadducees. They were the experts in the scriptures. They were the resident experts in the law in that day. And they, Jesus is saying, you don't even know the scripture because you missed it. You missed the power of God. And how easy is that for us as Christians too, right? Right? So we get into the word, we do our devos, we, go, we, we kind of punch the clock and we're like doing our part in our faith. But if we miss the power of God, how are we any different than the Sadducees? Who were sad, you see. <laughs> My favorite use of the word dunamis, <laughs> this is why I don't tell jokes when I start, okay? All I got is like two dad jokes and I'm done. I like how the, the, the Greek word dunamis is used to talk about the miraculous works of God. So let's take a look at Luke chapter 9. One day Jesus called together his 12 disciples and he gave them power and authority to, to cast out demons and to heal diseases. Then, then he sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God 
and heal the sick. So I've titled this message, There's No Panic in the Presence, and I, that's the big idea I'm trying to communicate this morning. Through the dunamis power of God, we can do all things, including conquering our own fears. We could silence our inner demons. We could find peace in impossible places through the dunamis power of God. We could lead lost people to the goodness of God, not because of us, but because of him and his dunamis power. Amen? So there's no panic in the presence. Therefore, we need a revelation of his presence. Even the disciples who were physically with Jesus didn't fully understand the power of his presence. We can see this in Mark chapter 4 where Jesus calms the storm. Jesus was in a boat. The disciples were with him. A storm came and they began to panic, right? So let's read it. Mark chapter four, beginning at verse 35. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side. Somebody say the other side, the other side. So they took Jesus in the boat and they started out leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping on the back of the boat with his head on a cushion, passed out. Sunday afternoon nap. The disciples woke him up shouting, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Come on, how many times have we gone to Jesus and said, Lord, don't you care that I'm in this crisis right here, right? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. And then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified, and they said, who is this man? Because they didn't fully understand. They didn't have that revelation yet of who he was. We have the benefit of history, right, and of, and of the text, and, and we know who he is. But let's, we still, many of us still need a revelation of his dunamis power. So turn to your neighbor and say, the Lord is with you. Turn to your other neighbor and say, he's in the boat. So Jesus was in the boat with his disciples, and yet they panicked. And you might say, well, Jesus isn't with me. He's not in my F-250 as I'm rolling down the bypass. Like, he's not with me, so what do, what do I have? Now, you and I have something better than Jesus in the boat. We have something better than Jesus in our Honda Odyssey on 322. We have the Holy Spirit. I'll make a case for why I'm saying better, but let's, hear me out here. Jesus said that God the Father would send an advocate as, re as his representative here on the earth. That is the Holy Spirit. Let's go to John 14 and start me off, uh, Mike, at verse 23, if you will. But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit. He will teach you everything, say everything, and remind you of everything I've told you. All right. Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. I love how he inserts this right here in the middle of the text. He does it earlier in the same chapter. My father will love them and, and, and we will come and make our home with each of them. So obedience is required, y'all, okay? Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me, moving on, and remember my words are not my own. What I'm telling you is from the father who sent me. I'm telling you these things now while I'm still with you. And I am leaving you with the gift. This is our opening scripture. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is the gift the world cannot give, so don't be troubled or afraid. So this is the promise of God, right? Well, if we're gonna experience this promise, we've got to get into his presence. Jesus said, I'm leaving with you a gift, so don't be troubled or afraid. Now, doesn't that sound like something we could all use a little bit more of, right? Peace. The Bible calls it a peace that passes all understanding, right? The peace that doesn't make sense, right? There's no panic in the presence of God. The presence of God, that is the Holy Spirit, brings the gift the world cannot give, that is peace. That is peace of mind and peace of heart. This is a powerful, life-changing revelation. But let's not miss the big picture like the Sadducees did. It's more than just his presence. The dunamis power of his presence God's presence will give us more than the ability to overcome fear. The presence comes with power, dunamis power, 
Don't miss the power. We know that Jesus gave power to his disciples. We know he promised to send the Holy Spirit in his place when he rose to the right hand of the Father. Uh, He said that we would do greater things. And this is why I say we have something more, we have a better benefit on our side with the Holy Spirit than the disciples did with Jesus right there. Because he said we would do greater things. That means we have the capacity, the ability to, and the promise to do greater things than Jesus himself did. How? Not because of us, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. He says it earlier in the same chapter. Same chapter. Let's take a look. John 14, but I'm going to begin at verse 12. And he says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I've done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Now listen. What is the point of God's dunamis power? Uh, We can't miss this little line right here. So that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Glory is the point of his dunamis power. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it if you love me, obey my commandments. And there he is again talking about obedience. There's no power in disobedience. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world can't receive him because it isn't looking for him, and it doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. So God's dunamis power is in you. Say, he's in me. We got that? So now we've set the table for the power of the Holy Spirit. Spirit, And I want to just talk practically for a few minutes about how we experience his power. How do we experience the power of his presence? I want to start by taking us to a strange, uh, uh, interesting passage of scripture in Exodus chapter 33. It's one of the many cases where God gets super frustrated with the Israelites and just wants to roast them on the spot. Okay, it's it's great. It happens throughout (laughs) the Old Testament. Uh, Thank Jesus. Thank you for Jesus, all right, because we're covered. We're good. Uh, So we're in the Old Testament right here. Uh, if If you're online with us right now, just type, here we go. Here we go. So the context here in Exodus 33, before I get to it, is that Moses has led the people out of Egypt. They've seen these miraculous signs and wonders, right? Moses has gone up to the mountain to meet with the Lord face to face. And he's come back down with the Ten Commandments. And he was up on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. And during that time, the people got restless. And they went to Aaron and for some reason said, for some reason they forgot. Like it only took you 40 days to forgot the Red Sea was parted. And all the crazy, you know, shenanigans that the Lord did, like the plague of locusts and all that stuff. They forgot. And they wanted to build an altar, a golden altar to some other god, Right? And the Lord knows this because he's omniscient and he sees it. And he says to Moses now in chapter 33, get going. (laughs) You and the people you brought up from the land of Egypt. Didn't the Lord call them out and told Moses to go get them, right? Go up to the land I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I told them I'll give you this land to your descendants. And I will send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, all the otherites. Go up to this land that flows with milk and honey. But I will not travel with you. I won't travel among you. For you are a stubborn and rebellious people. This is God speaking to Moses about the Israelites. If I did, I'd surely destroy you along the way. Okay. When the people heard these stern words, they went into mourning and they stopped wearing their jewelry and fine clothes, significant because they gave their jewelry to be melted down to make that golden calf. For the Lord had told uh, Moses to tell them, you are a stubborn and rebellious people. If I were to travel with you even for a moment, I'd destroy you. Remove your jewelry and fine clothes while I decide what to do with you. So the Lord is anger. This is righteous anger. So from the time they left Mount Sinai, the Israelites wore no jewelry or fine clothes. And it was Moses' practice to take to the tent of meeting and set it up some distance from the camp. Everyone who wanted to make a request of the Lord would go to the 
tent of meeting outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent of meeting, all the people would get up and stand in the entrances of their own tent, and they would watch Moses until he disappeared inside. And as he went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and hover. The manifest presence of God would come down and hover at its entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. When the people saw the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they would stand and bow down in front of their own tents And inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks with a friend. Afterward, Moses would return to the camp, but the young man who assisted him, Joshua, the son of Nun, would remain behind in the tent of meeting. Now, ton of scripture right there. Let me just say that this portion of scripture clearly demonstrates the distance between God and his people under the old covenant, right? He had the high priest who could see God, but Moses in this case could see the Lord face to face, but nobody else could get even near him. So Moses spoke face to face, but the people were off at a distance. And we can see this also in the design of the tabernacle where you have the Holy of Holies, which is separated by that curtain, the veil, which was torn in two when Jesus died on the cross which is the new covenant. So when Jesus breathed his last, last breath on the cross, that division between God and man came down. And rather uh, than God manifesting himself inside the temple, uh, the physical temple, he began to, or the tabernacle, he began to manifest himself inside you and I. So you and I are the temple now. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm the temple. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. So now we're talking about the manifest presence of God. The presence of God is in us. So you and I are welcome in the presence of God. Somebody say amen. 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 So this morning, I want to give you four principles to consider that will, so we, we have a good understanding, I think, of the, of the presence of God, the dunamis power of God. We're welcome in his presence. His presence exists within us. But how do we, how do we leverage that? How do we get into alignment with the power of the presence and make sure we're not just like the Sadducees who completely miss it? And it begins with number one, want. It begins with your want. And here's a key thought for you this morning. The power of the presence begins with the desire to see God move in your life. Now, I wanted to qualify this statement a little better, but I actually left it alone because I wanted you to see uh, what I'm seeing here. As I make this statement, this is, these are my words, by the way. This isn't the Bible. This is, that's my statement based on biblical principles. And I'm thinking I could probably say it a little better. So let me walk through this revelation with you. We want to see God moving in our life. Isn't that correct? Right? But it's not about the move. It's about the glory. Sometimes he doesn't move. Does that make him less worthy? So I'm saying the power of the presence begins with the desire to see God move in our lives. But arguably, it really begins when we desire to see God glorified in our lives. You see that? So we don't serve God because he's the great genie in the bottle. We serve God because he's the great I am. Now there's a shift in the thinking process where you start to put God in his proper place, right? And he's worthy to be praised. Therefore, uh, the power of the presence requires want, that is desire, but not to see God move, to see God glorified. He's glorified. He is glorified in the miraculous moves as it shows himself strong, right? He is glorified uh, when he answers your prayer because it demonstrates his might and his goodness and his favor and his mercy, right? Right? But we need to want to see his glory, not his hand. We need to want to see his glory, not his hand. (laughs) Do you understand the significance of that shift, that that mentality shift? God, I don't know if you're going to deliver me from anxiety, but you're worthy whether you do or not. And I'm going to give you praise. Do you understand? 
All right, so I ask you, what do you want? And leave it at his feet and just ask him to be glorified in your life. The greatest moments you and I will experience in our lives are not when our needs are met by his miraculous move, but when our hearts are bowed low, humbled before him, and he pours out his spirit in response. Exodus chapter 33, beginning at verse 3. Go up to this land that flows with milk and honey, but I will not travel with you, for you are a stubborn and rebellious people. If I did, I'd surely destroy you along the way. When the people heard these stern words, they went into mourning and they stopped wearing their jewelry and their fine clothes. And that was because that had been used, right, to build a false idol, not because there was anything wrong with jewelry or fine clothes. The moment the Israelites were given the green light to head to the promised land, this is right here, go, God says go, but I won't go with you, right? They're given, they've been waiting for this for hundreds of years, go. And they have enough sense in this moment to stop. They were given the green light to go into the promised land, the fulfillment of generations of promises. God says go, but I won't go with you. So how did they respond? They responded right. They went into mourning. They'd just been chastised, right, for worshiping false idols. Now, don't miss this. They wanted the promise, but not at the expense of the presence. Moses said, God, don't send me without you. The people went into mourning when God said go, because he also said, I won't go with you. The promise, which is, in our context, our desired outcomes, the things we're believing for, right? Maybe it's being set free from depression and anxiety. Maybe it's seeing a loved one healed. Maybe it's a financial miracle. Whatever that promise is that we're believing for, those things are empty without the presence of God. That's why clinical matters. We need the clinical when it comes to mental health and healing, but we also need the power, the dunamis power of the presence of God. The, pre the presence of God manifested in your life. It begins with want. It begins with a desire. It begins with a decision to say, Jesus, you are Lord. I, I get it now. I confess you are high and lifted up, God. It begins with desire. And I would say to you, what do you want? Do you want security? Do you want purpose? Do you want success? Do you want health? Do you want love? I'm sure you want the good things of life, and I do too, but do you want God more? And if not, then you've created a false idol out of the good things and have substituted the good things for the goodness of God. Don't substitute good things for the goodness of God. That's what the Bible calls idolatry. Each of us, in this regard, we'll find ourselves in two kingdoms of conflict. It's the kingdom of God and it's the kingdom of man, right? It's the kingdom of God and it's the kingdom of me. Two kingdoms, one battle. And that battle rages on the battlefield of our hearts. It rages for control of our soul. Your want, your want is the ammunition for the weapons used in this battle. So be careful what you want for We've got two kingdoms in conflict that cannot live at peace with one another. Your want is at the center of it all. And each kingdom demands your loyalty and your worship. God demands your loyalty and your worship. And so does the kingdom of the earth. Each kingdom promises you life. One kingdom leads to life in the moment. One kingdom leads to life everlasting. One kingdom leads to you as the king of kings. And the other sets uh, leads to him as the king of kings. And the other sets you up as the king. You see the contrast here? A king, your king, you as a king, in a kingdom that can easily be toppled. In a moment, our lives can be toppled by a virus, by a diagnosis, by some sort of crisis, by a moment of indiscretion. Our worlds can be turned entirely upside down. We think that we as kings of our own kingdoms have control, but control is an illusion. What I want and this is my confession, is to surrender control to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who advances my purpose on earth for his purpose in heaven. What do you want? Do you want good things or do you want the goodness of God? 
The good things of this world are temporary, but the goodness of God is forever. God was going to send his people into the promised land, good things. But he wouldn't go without, he he wasn't going to send his presence. That's the goodness of God. But note in the end, the Israelites got both. Right? They got the promised land. Although the next generation did. That's, that's further down the story. <laughs> the good things and the goodness of God are, are, are not mutually exclusive. One simply needs to submit to the other. We've got to submit all of our selfish wants to the Lord and lay them at his feet like sacrifices of praise. And if we do that, the good things will follow. Or not. Because we do live in a broken world and things don't always work out until Jesus comes again. Somebody say amen. Amen. So this week I want you to read this verse every day. And I want you to get this in your spirit. I want you to make this your confession. And I want you to let this shape your want. I'm spending a lot of time on point number one. I'll get through the next three points a little more quickly. But this is so important because it starts here. Psalms chapter 63 verse 1. Oh God, you are my God. Early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Now, I don't care what you're going through. If you start out your communication with the Lord like that, everything else falls into perspective because you're giving God glory, right? So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. Thus, I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. How do we get in alignment with the power of the presence of God? It starts with our want. Number two, word. Turn to your neighbor and say word. 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 If we're going to get into God's presence and leverage his dunamis power, we have to be in the word. If you're not in the word, you're missing it. It's like uh, wood with no spark. There's no fire, right? You've got the tools, but you don't have the fuel. You need the word. You and I are consumers. We all consume things. I have many things I consume. If you follow me on Instagram, you would know this, right? I have things I am about, right? And so do you, let's be fair. So I would ask it as I ask myself, have you checked your spirit's diet lately? Your spirit's diet. And here's a key thought for you this morning. The power of the presence begins with the discipline to consume God's word. The Bible says, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse one. What are you consuming? Netflix, social media, news, I consume these things too, but not at the cost of or in place of the word. His presence is in the word. I need to be in his presence. I need to be in the word. If you show me what you consume, I'll show you what you're hungry for. And we consume a variety of things, but there must be priority. For example, if you're spending money on frivolous things and not tithing you're not really in obedience with the scripture and that's not a you're not honoring God and you know you're not prioritizing him right so the practice of the power of the presence begins with the discipline to consume God's word the Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God and the word was God John 1 1 The power of God's presence requires the word. And it says this in Hebrews chapter four. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. The discipline of seeking God begins with the discipline to manage what we consume. And above all, may we consume things of the spirit in priority. 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is inspired by God and it's useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Somebody say amen. Amen. The practice of the power of the presence of God begins with your want and it requires the word and it is expressed through Worship, number three. The practice of the presence 
of God begins with your want. It requires the word and it's expressed through worship. Here's a key thought for you. The power of the presence requires a heart of worship. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 33, beginning at verse nine, and it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle, uh, at the tabernacle door and all the people rose and worshiped each man in his tent door. The pillar of cloud was the same one that led the Israelites out of Egypt. The, The people saw the pillar but could not approach as Moses did, right? This is Old Testament. Moses saw God and spoke to him as as one would a friend, face to face. But the people had to worship God from a distance. Bette Midler comes to mind. From a distance, sorry. That all changed. Somebody say that changed. That changed for you and me the moment Jesus breathed his last breath on the cross and that veil was symbolically torn in the temple which had previously separated us from God's manifest presence. Now, go back to Exodus 33 and verse 10. It says, all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door and all the people rose and worshiped each man at his tent door. You see, the people recognized the presence of God and they, they bowed down, they worshiped. Not only that, but because of the holiness of God, they also had to keep their distance, right? Jesus changed all that. Now you and I are welcome in the presence of God. Our high priest is Jesus. So how do we worship God? Well, when was the last time you humbled yourself before him? Have your knees ever seen the floor? Have you ever just laid on your face before him? I gotta tell you, man, there is something real about physically submitting your body before the Lord. In an empty room with nobody around, lay on your face and just pray. And if you don't know what to pray, I'm gonna take you right back to Psalms 63 and say, oh God, you are my God. Early I will seek you, my soul thirsts for you. On your face my flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I've looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. Thus, I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. Just get on your face. Worship is not a song. And for those of you who are regulars here, you know you've heard me say this before. Uh, And I'm a worship guy, obviously. Uh, But worship is not a song. It's a position of the heart. John 4, 23 says, but the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And the Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. He's looking for people that would just bow down and give him glory. Show me where you invest your time, your talent, and your treasure, and I'll show you what you worship. Let's make sure we've not elevated anything in our lives above the Lord. No golden calves. And consider this, if the word is wood for the fire, right? Wood for the fire of your soul, then worship is the spark. All right, let's review, and we're about to close. Let's review. The practice of the power of God's presence, it begins with your want, right? It requires the word, It's expressed through worship, and it's proven in work. Number four, work. The power of the presence requires work. Luke chapter 9, verse 1. One day, Jesus called together his 12 disciples, and he gave them power and authority to cast out all demons and to heal diseases. Then... He sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and heal the sick. Why did God give his disciples the power, his dunamis power? It was to heal, cast, communicate, disciple. It was to get the word out and to do miraculous things in his name. We all have a responsibility. Jesus gives us power, then calls us to do God's work. And the work I'm talking about is God's redemption. God's agenda is to redeem his people and to bring them to the saving knowledge of Jesus. And he wants you and I to be a part of it. 
So we need to be about what he's about, right? The power of the presence requires work, and it's a commandment. If you look in John chapter 13, beginning of verse 34, a new commandment I give you, new covenant, new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, they all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Let me tell you something. It takes a lot of work to love some of you. (laughs) That didn't come out right. You can't love each other well without the dunamis power of God. We've been given the power to be effective. Husbands, you've been given the dunamis power to love your wives. Wives, you've been given the dunamis power to tolerate your husbands. Come on, somebody. You've been given the power to be effective. To quote Aunt May in the latest Spider-Man film, With great power comes great responsibility. We have a responsibility in all seriousness. Acts chapter one, verse eight. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God has given you a responsibility to share the good news with the world. It says so in Mark chapter 16. And he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. God has given you the responsibility to share the good news of Jesus uh, with the world from a heart of love. It says so in Mark chapter 12. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. God has given you a responsibility to share the good news of Jesus with the world, with your words and your actions, according to Colossians chapter 3, which says... And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Colossians chapter 4, 9, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. My last key thought is that the power of the presence leads to the desire to see God move in the lives of those around you. Troy Maxwell put it this way. The best way to find meaning in your life is to help someone else find meaning in theirs. Right? Jesus put it this way. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this. I'm with you always to the end of the age. Come on, let's stand to our feet here in this house. Worship team, you can come. We are gonna do that chorus. So in a moment, we're about to sing this chorus from that, that song, we, our third song today, The House of Miracles. And I just want you to get that perspective in mind that I was talking about earlier. It's not about our want, it's about his glory. It's not about good things, it's about his goodness, right? So I know that there's something in your life that you need to surrender right now. Uh, it's a broken heart. It's a fearful heart. I don't know what it is, but I know that each one of us has something that they can lay before the Lord as what the Bible calls a sacrifice of praise. So in just a moment, we're going to bring this song in, and I'm going to invite you to respond by thinking as we sing these words and imagining that you're just throwing, you're just casting off things and laying them at his feet. Can we do that this morning? James chapter 1 and verse 22 says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Want. Word, worship, work. These are just practical things to get us into alignment with the power, the dunamis power, the presence of God. So right now, I just want to ask the team to lead us into this course just for a moment before we're dismissed, and then I'm going to then I'm going to take it back. I'm going to stay up here with you guys. Come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Come alive in the 
name of Jesus, come alive. In the name of Jesus, this is a house of miracles. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Come alive in the name. morning and you haven't made that first decision, that that want, it's desire. I want to invite you with every head bowed and every eye closed, let's take a moment. If you haven't made a decision to follow Jesus, the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. So why not start now? Let's let that desire to see God set you free take effect right now. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that you will be saved. So just a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer, and I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. If there's anybody in this house this morning that say, include me in that prayer, just lift your hand up so I can see it. Is there anybody here that say, that's me? We're just going to pray this prayer together. I see that hand. Thank you. I want you to pray this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, today I choose to follow you. I declare you are God, and I am not. And today, I am a Christian forgiven and free in dunamis power in Jesus name amen amen now maybe you're here this morning and you've you've been following Jesus but you're not quite free yet you see the Bible says he who the Son sets free is free indeed right so therefore we shouldn't be shackled to our shame and our pain and anything else that might be slowing us down or inhibiting God's dunamis power from moving in our lives so I'm just going to assume that's going to apply to about 99% of us. And there's something that we can leave at God's feet. And I'm going to pray a prayer releasing that over you. Are you ready to receive that? All right, every head bowed and every eye closed. Those of you joining us online as well. Jesus, I ask you to move in dunamis power by the power of your Holy Spirit right now across the room in Jesus name Lord I break addiction in Jesus name I break anxiety in Jesus name I break high blood pressure in Jesus name God you're healing bodies right now you're healing hearts right now you're healing minds right now you're healing relationships right now because it's for your glory Lord in Jesus name Hey, thanks for tuning in to our online experience. It's our prayer that you experience the freedom and life that only God has to offer. If you have a prayer request or a question, go ahead and drop us a line. Email us at hope at freedom.life. And if this message blessed you, share it on social media, send it to a friend, be a hope dealer. And again, thanks for tuning in. And we believe in your life, the best is still yet to come.